Well, if you don't know the stats, it's one in three pieces of clothing made every year goes to landfill unsold. Unsold, just think about that. One in every three pieces. Mm -hmm. And that's because the model is fundamentally broken. You know, people make stuff that they can't sell because they're trying, you know, chasing unit prices and trying to get those unit prices down as much as possible. Mm. And then there's the labor and the transport and the whole bit only to plow one in three pieces back into the ground. It's like, it's just insane. Hello and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Formosa, the founder of Fashion Equipped and devourer of all things fashion, business and mindset. In this podcast, I'm speaking with thought leaders, change makers and entrepreneurs about the business side of fashion and everything in between. Fashion Business Mindset is your front row seat to real stories from designers, brands, entrepreneurs, makers and mentors. We'll discuss how to launch and grow a fashion business and give you insider access to the future of fashion. So let's do this together and ensure that you're equipped to make the fashion business your business. Welcome back to Fashion Business Mindset. My guest today is Zoltan Charki, the co-founder of Citizen Wolf. Zoltan is on a mission to save our planet by re-engineering the way that clothes are made at scale. As a certified B Corp, Citizen Wolf exists to validate a new model for the fashion industry that is better for customers and better for the planet at the same time. Their proprietary Magic Fit technology combines the power of algorithms with a purpose-built factory in Sydney to create the circular, on-demand and custom-fit future the fashion industry so desperately needs. Eight years in, Citizen Wolf has achieved many milestones and won many awards. Zoltan speaks regularly about the journey of Citizen Wolf, as well as the intersection of fashion, technology and local manufacturing. Citizen Wolf is Zoltan's third startup. Now, just a little warning before we go any further, there is some swearing during this conversation, predominantly the F word, which you're just about to hear. Now, this is in context with Citizen Wolf's mission. So if this type of language offends you, I just wanted to give you a little heads up. So during our chat, Zoltan and I discuss Citizen Wolf's mission, which is to unfuck the fashion industry by making mass production obsolete. We then dive into the technology and the team driving the Citizen Wolf Magic Fit customised model. We talk about the shift towards more conscious consumerism and that Citizen Wolf is a zero waste, fully circular business model. And most recently, that Citizen Wolf has launched its second crowdfunding campaign with the goal to take the business to the next level. Now, this crowdfunding campaign closes on the 30th of May. So tune in and then circle back to the details in our show notes. Now, I was inspired by this real and raw conversation with Zoltan, and I'm sure you will be too. So let's dive in. Zoltan, welcome to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. It's so, so nice to be here. It's always an honor to be able to talk about Citizen Wolf. So thanks. Oh, I can't wait to dive in. Now, before we do, I'd love for you to set the scene for our audience. Just introduce yourself and give them a little bit of an insight into your background before becoming the co-founder of Citizen Wolf. Sure. So my name is Zoltan Charki, one of the co-founders uh, of Citizen Wolf, and it is a bit of a circuitous, you know, route or story that led me here. Uh, my background is advertising, so I'm not from the fashion industry, and neither is my original co-founder, Eric. In fact, we met in an ad agency here in Sydney um, in 2003, so a fairly long time ago now. He went off to Asia and lived in China and, and Hong Kong and had his career in advertising there. I went to Europe and had a successful career in, you know, in big ad, ad, ad agencies over that part of the world and 
you know, I loved it. It was great. You know, it was, it was good. It's a young man's game, I think, for, for the most part. Um, my last job was making digital products, basically. Uh, so that blur, that sort of gray area between advertising and, and products. So I worked for an American agency that was called RGA, and they were famous for making Nike Plus, if you remember that. Like back in the day, it was the first sort of connected thing that made you, basically, it was like connecting your shoes with running. And anyway, it was a thing, and it was cool. And and so I was working at that agency, and, and we were making things like that for other brands. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was awesome. But ultimately, I got sick of it because there's so much waste in that business. Like, it's incredible. It's you don't think about it as waste because it's not tangible necessarily. It's not landfill, right? But just so much of that business is just like spinning your wheels and doing presentations which go nowhere and pitching and which goes nowhere. And, you know, um, it just got really tiring. And I I was sick of, you know, having ideas and, and very rarely being able to execute them. So I thought I was smart enough to make some software <laughs> and my own digital product. Um, so I quit my well-paid job in advertising, much to, you know, my my family's chagrin, uh, and invested my life savings into that product, which ultimately failed very painfully. You know, I was an art director in advertising, and so numbers were not my, you know, my strong suit, basically. Yeah, I basically dove headfirst into trying to sell B2B software effectively. So, you know, when I look back on it, it's kind of no wonder that that I didn't succeed. But anyway, I, I learned an incredible amount from that experience. Yep. Um, I, had, I was broke at the end. I was pretty deflated, as you can imagine. And I really should have gone back to advertising <laughs> at, that, at that point. I didn't. Uh, I fell into a fashion brand with a very good friend of mine um, at the time. And we spent the next six years basically trying to scale from a graphic t-shirt brand into like a menswear brand. Again, we had no background in fashion. We had no idea what we were doing, but this was really the dawn of Facebook and Facebook ads. And so we were very early into that side of things. Uh, We were all online. We weren't wholesale, but we were running a traditional model for the most part. You know, we made product in China. We made product in Portugal. We had it warehoused all over the world. Yeah. I ran two Kickstarters, but yeah, basically six years in realized that it just, the numbers weren't stacking up. It was about that time I got back to Sydney and Eric was back in Sydney as well at that point. And he was sick of advertising and mm-hmm. I was broke for the second time and <laughs> deflated for the second time because, you know, this thing that I thought was going to, you know, be be my ticket out of, you know, in into fashion just didn't work. And so, yeah. Again, probably both of us should have gone back to advertising at that point, but um, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to, and neither did he, to his credit. And so we sat down and decided we were going to do something. Didn't really know what it was. Um, he'd come out of advertising and gone into conservation work with the IUCN, which is like the supranational body body that sits above the United Nations. So all, all the national governments pay money into this pot to the IUCN and then and then they basically protect the environment all around the world. Yeah. So he was working at the very highest levels of sort of, you know, uh, demand reduction effectively. So using his advertising skills for good instead of to sell more hamburgers. And <laughs> he, um, and so that was really good and fulfilling, but yeah, he was looking for the next challenge and, and I knew enough about fashion to be dangerous. And so... We basically said, let's try and do something. Um, And then over many, many late nights and and weeks and months, sort of the the idea of Citizen Wolf began to emerge. So, yeah, that's that's the story. Love it. So what I'm hearing is you're not new to the startup space. You seem to be a serial entrepreneur, let's call it. You had a passion there from the early days of reducing waste and reducing the negative impact in business. So no doubt that served you well with where you are today and you've got an amazing business partner. So together, you know, you're a force to be reckoned with. Is it easy? No. Is there a lot to do on the journey? Yes. And we'll we'll dive into some of that. So thank you for sharing that background. Let's talk about Citizen Wolf as it stands today. Let's share the brand story, the ethos, the values and and what you're setting out to achieve. So, you know, we've been at it for eight years. There's a lot of clarity that comes through through time, basically. 
And today, you know, we're much we're much clearer on on what we do and why uh, mm. than we have, than we ever were. So, Citizen Wolf exists quite simply to unfuck the fashion industry and save our planet because the default model of fashion, so mass production, overproduction, is simply incompatible with solving climate change, and we cannot change the trajectory on the climate crisis without changing the way that the fashion industry operates mm. that's just unequivocal in my opinion why do i say that well if you don't know the stats it's one in three pieces of clothing made every year goes to landfill unsold right unsold just think about that one in every three pieces mm. and that's because the model is fundamentally broken you know people make stuff that they can't sell because they're trying, you know, chasing unit prices and trying to get those unit prices down as much as possible. And you think about all of the input costs that go into the clothes, right? The the fabrics and the fibers and the, you know, the petroleum when when you're making polyester stuff and and we don't at Citizen Wolf, but everybody else does. Mm. And then there's the labor and the transport and the whole bit. And it's you know, only to plow one in three pieces back into the ground. It's like, it's just insane and it's actually unconscionable. And so our starting point with the brand was like, the world doesn't need another fashion brand. Like that's pretty clear. But fashion needs a new blueprint in mm. terms of how it can operate going into the future. Um, you know, frankly, to maintain its social license, because at the moment it is incompatible with humanity's <laughs> ability to continue surviving. Yeah. And so Eric and I decided that we would try and tackle this problem. And so what we do at Citizen Wolf, that's our, our, you know, our vision or our mission is to, to unfuck fashion. And we do that by creating the technology that makes mass production obsolete. Because as I was saying, the problem is overproduction. And I guess the simplest distillation of what we do at Citizen Wolf is this. Rather than pretend that we know what somebody might want to buy, in six months time which is that's how the rest of the industry operates and they get it wrong all the time and they get it wrong because nobody has a crystal ball and nobody can accurately predict future behavior doesn't matter we're talking about fashion or anything else that's just like nobody can do that so but our entire or the entire default fashion industry is predicated on pretending to know what somebody's going to do or want to do or want to buy in six months time right so instead of doing that Quite simply, we just ask you what you want today and then we go and make it. Yeah, It's a radically simple idea that will fundamentally transform the destructive fashion industry. Yeah. And so we exist to prove that this can be done at scale because if you ask anybody else in the industry, certainly anybody in a big existing incumbent fashion brand, they'll tell you that it's impossible. They'll say that mass production is the only way to to deliver product to to people and so we exist to prove that that's fundamentally untrue yeah i would love to dive into proving that to our audience today i'd love to unpack that a little bit because yeah. i think your statement is polarizing i saw you recently on a panel at the australian cotton forum and i've seen you speak historically and your, you know, your statement of, of your mission is to unfuck the fashion industry. It gets people's attention, right? It gets people's attention. I think though, there's still this uh, perception out there that we can only do so much and, you know, can we really make a difference at scale? As you rightly said, does the world need another fashion brand? Does the world need more products? You know, what is truly sustainable? Well, let's just stop making stuff. But that's not the reality. There's people in the supply chain. There's livelihoods. There's, you know, that people's lives depend on um, the business models that we have in place, not only in our industry, but many others. So I'd love to firstly go deeper into exactly how your business model works, what the customer journey is like. Mm. And then I think we touch on what's working, perhaps what's been super challenging for you to even overcome in your business and how you do see this operating at scale to essentially solve the problem that you've rightly, you know, shone a light on. Yeah. Um, look, the, I'm, I'm the first person to say it. it's really different when you're operating at the scale that we are today 
or certainly when we began even. And, you know, to your point, I was on the panel last week at um, at the Cotton Forum here in Sydney with somebody from VF Corp who yeah. was saying he makes, they make 500 million items a year, right? And so we're at fundamentally different ends of the spectrum here. And yeah, you're right. There is a, an enormous amount of people uh, all the way down the supply chain that that rely on the existing scale and frankly what I would consider to be the existing but broken business model. My challenge to you would be to say, yes, that's true. But like if the planet dies, who cares? Like it's sort of it's all for nothing, right? And we are on a course if fashion doesn't change. I mean, there's many, many problems that humanity needs to solve more widely than fashion. Don't get me wrong, but fashion is part of the must be part of the solution. Like we have to change the fashion industry. Yep. It's so big and it's so, it touches everybody every day on the planet. Everybody has to wear something to cover their their naughty bits, you know, like (laughs) we all need to interface with it. But um, I think there, there's a way of doing it, which um, in many ways it's, it's going back to the way it always was. Right. So like prior to the industrial revolution, fashion was fit for purpose. If nobody had a wardrobe full of stuff, in fact, they didn't even have wardrobes. They had just pegs on the wall and you had you had the work clothes and then you had your, your church clothes effectively, right? Now, I don't believe in church and God, but point being, nobody had heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff and nobody needs heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff either. So now we're starting to talk about behavior and, you know, fast fashion and that that's like, that's something else entirely. But, you know, back, back to your question about how do we operate? So... If you think I, I about, think I, I might just yeah. pause there for a minute because I think you've again you've touched on some really significant points. I was talking about this the other day with someone. It was like you know the good old days of having your Sunday best, whether you were going right. to church or not. It was your Sunday best. It was your you know it was your one good outfit that you owned and you'd put it on and you'd feel a million dollars and right. you know right. you'd show up with all of this pride because you know it was special. It was may not have been a special occasion, but it was a special day where you got to dress up. Uh, We have been conditioned over many, many years to buy in to this, you know, fast fashion kind of consumption. It's like everything being readily available to us, not just fashion, but food and all of the, you know, mod cons that we've become, become accustomed to. And now we're going into this era of really unconditioning ourselves you know we we really conditioned in to operate in a certain way and there's this sort of unlearning of um what's important in life and I think there was a huge value shift as well you know post-covid everyone did a lot of soul searching during that time and we we had a front row seat on what could potentially happen to the earth if we stopped you know, the consumption and the impact that was happening on a daily basis. You know, there was this yeah. regeneration phase of regeneration yeah. when we went a bit easier on the earth. So I think there was, you know, some profound kind of awakenings during that time. But just like anything, life goes on and you get back into your old habits. But I yeah. am hearing a lot around, you know, better quality, um, investment pieces, you know, doing more with less. There's The language is changing now we need the behaviours to change. So yeah. if um, there's a customer or anyone tuning in right now and they're thinking, I love this idea of the custom made, I want to be more minimal with what I'm investing in in my wardrobe, I want to be more conscious, shop my values, how do they do that with Citizen Wolf? Everything we make is to order. We make to order. So as I said, we only make what we sell. Now the downside with that model is that our customers have to wait. Yep. It's quite simple. And to your point, that that goes against almost all of the conditioning that we've had, um, certainly within the fashion context of the recent past. You know, like the Iconic got famous a few years ago or when they launched for, you know, or get it to me in three hours kind of thing. And and that like speed of delivery, it seems to be the thing that is, has been the, the motivating factor within the industry. Sort of, you know, since e-commerce touched everyone apart from, you know, just just the nerds back in the day. So the downside with made to order is you have to wait. And so our our core thesis was in order to make people feel better about waiting for their stuff, what if we made it custom fit to their body? Because tailoring has always existed. Um, The traditional bastions were, you know, fancy suits and wedding dresses. And we just, Eric and I, at the start, we were like, how insane is it that 
the clothes that fit us best, we wear the least, mm-hmm. right? Like basically one day in your life you get married and you have a, re- a dress that fits you perfectly or a suit that fits you perfectly, right? And then, you know, it's a little bit easier for blokes. You get to wear the suit a couple of times maybe, but like ultimately very, very few times. And then the rest of the time we're wearing all of the other clothes that we wear and and like frankly, most of them don't fit us very well because the stats are very clear mass sizing or standard size breaks fail 81% of people, right? Most people fall in between a the size. There's very few people that that perfectly fit the medium of, of brand X, right? And then you get into the whole thing of, well, this medium is different to that medium. And then mm-hmm. shit, even within brands, you know, you'll have two mediums that come out of different factories and they're different, right? For all intents and purposes, they should be the same, but they're not. So it's incredibly frustrating for the consumer to find clothes that fit. And so we, when we began, we were like, well, why isn't anybody doing tailoring for these clothes, these everyday clothes, these wardrobe staples that everybody wears and everybody wears through crucially and and wants to and needs to replace? Why isn't anybody making these clothes tailored? And what, you know, could, could we do it? So basically today, if you go into Citizen Wolf, you'll see that we've built some technology that we call Magic Fit. And that that's basically the the simplest uh, UX for custom fit in the world. There's no measuring tapes. There's no body scans. There's no awkward photos in your knickers either, Mm -hmm. which some other people sort of might ask you for. Um, There's no configurator on the site. All we need is your height, weight, age. And for women, we ask bra as well, as well as a note about your body. So, Everyone's grown up having their mum tell them things like you've got a long torso or you've got wide shoulders or long femurs or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. You just know this stuff about your body. So if you can give us that note, that really allows us to calibrate the statistical model. Put together, Magic Fit's 94% accurate. So what, what Magic Fit does is it creates a mathematical model of your body. And then we use that model, that mathematical model, we use it as the fit model for your clothes. Mm-hmm. right? So you are your own fit model is basically how it works. So that's magic fit. Our tech stack is three layers. So the second layer we call Garmin OS. That is the the software that we've built that powers the factory. So it takes your magic fit, understands what you bought, and then basically smashes them together to dynamically generate the custom fit panels, lay it all out ready, like on a marker, ready for our laser cutter. And then the third part of the uh, the tech stack is that is our factory because we actually had to create our own factory in Sydney because nobody in the existing supply chain wanted to work with us. Mm. Nobody wanted to change the way that they work, right? When we began, like the cut, the guys that sold us the fabric at the start told us we were crazy. The pattern makers told us we were crazy. Everybody we met said that it couldn't be done because we started also only with t-shirts, right? So we were for the first five years of the business we were selling tailored or custom fit t-shirts now we did t-shirts because they were easy to make and we had our work cut out for us on the supply side right trying to create this technology trying to understand how to run a factory because like not only is my background not in fashion but it's certainly not in like factory or making things either yeah so we had to sort of like we had to insource all of these skills that, that we didn't have um but yeah, so I guess now the the point is if you go onto the website now, this entire process is automated. So all all I need is your height, weight, age, bra, and uh, and a note about your body. You choose whatever style you want, whatever fabric you want, whatever color you want, and then we go and make that garment. And so the great news is that that means we run a zero inventory model. Yeah, and that's why we basically have zero waste. What's the turnaround time? You said, you know, obviously the, the number one thing is the customer has to wait. Well, yeah. How long does it take to make the product? So traditional tailoring will run you at somewhere between four and six weeks. Um, we turn around our T-shirts in five days. That's amazing. That's great. Well, Thank you. What's a, <laughs> it's what's not a, fast I mean, enough to compete with like the iconic, but then, you know, we're not, I don't think we're really competing with that because again, like, <laughs> What we're trying to do is create things that are going to last a long time. These are the basics that form the core of everybody's wardrobe. Yeah. And And we want them to last. And then so what we believe is that if you're going to wear this thing for years and years, Mm. 
what's a few extra days on the front end between like buying it on the iconic and having it, you know, within one or two days or buying it from us and having it within five or seven days, depending on where you live. So yeah, a little bit of time up front, all of this benefit because it's custom made to fit your body. And then what we find is that people have a different emotional connection with our clothes than they do with the stuff that they've bought off the rack. They chose the fabric, the color, the cut, the style, and obviously it's made to fit their body. And so what we find is that when that garment, if that garment sort of tears or breaks or something happens to it, rather than rush to replace, what our customers want to do is repair it. Mm. And, and we encourage that behavior. We have free repairs for life because it's the right thing to do for the planet. It's a terrible business decision, <laughs> but it's the right thing to do for the planet and for the customer, actually. And so, yeah, we make our things because it's not that much harder to make things to last than to make them to fall apart, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that much more difficult. So we make them to last at the start and then we offer free repairs for life. And then at the end of life, we have a take back scheme as well to, to close that circle. Uh, and then we, we take the, we take your, if you, if you send us your garment at the end of life, we'll combine that with the waste stream that comes off our production floor off the laser cutter. And then we convert that. We make, we make new yarn actually. And then we knit new Jersey out of that. So it's a 100% circular system, which I'm extremely proud about because again, you ask anybody in the existing industry and they'll tell you that that's impossible. It's, you can't be a hundred percent circular, but. Totally. I mean, you've achieved what every business out there in the fashion industry is striving towards, which is circularity. It's the most topical, um, you know, business focus at this point in time. So congratulations, first and foremost, on achieving yeah. that. It's outstanding. But I think back to waiting days, you know, waiting days is very palatable. If you think about even a traditional pre-order model, not even a custom yeah. model, just a pre-order model, you're waiting weeks, if not months. So yeah. I think what you've achieved there again is outstanding. I'd love to know what the strike rate is on the fit technology. So mm. again, what you've explained in terms of, you know, the mathematics that goes into this piece of technology that is allowing you to achieve these amazing results, how many returns do you get? And if you do get a certain percentage, why are they being returned? So how accurate is the magic fit technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, the, the reality is we don't get it right every time. Um, and if we don't, what we do is we offer free remakes. So at that point, if we send you something and it doesn't fit your body for whatever reason, or you just don't love it, um, at that point, we ask you to take three photographs of yourself wearing the garment, which we yeah. use to calibrate along with your feedback. And then we send you a, a brand new garment for free. We ask, we don't want the original garment back. You keep it. We ask you to donate it actually, because, you know, the charity shops need very high quality clothes because they don't get that anymore. They just get the fast fashion crap. And so they're always looking for really high quality donations. So we do encourage our, our customers to do that in, in these instances, but you know, you could equally sleep in it or use it to wash the car. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, the point is that what we're trying to do is get you something that perfectly fits because once we do that, we know that it's pretty sticky. Yeah. And is the strike rate good and has it improved over time? Right. Sorry. Yeah. And so the fail rate is, so I said it's 94% accurate. So the inverse statement is that our fail rate is about 6%, 6, yes. 7, maybe 8%, depending on sort of, you know, it fluctuates a little bit here and there, but it's fairly stable. That That's the fail rate. But when yeah. you, when you, when you look at it compared to return rates on fashion e-com yeah. and they're mostly driven by size, you know, they can, they can run above 30%. Some, sometimes I've heard as high as 50%, right? So like, on any day of the week, our technology is four times better in terms of four times fewer returns than the industry average. Yeah, amazing. And and there's no risk in it for the customer. As you said, you know, you're servicing them at a high standard and essentially there's going to be a win for everyone involved, even yeah. if you don't get it right. Yeah, you, yeah. you'll achieve the out, the ultimate outcome um, yeah. through so your guarantee. That's right. Yeah. So our refund rate is under 1%. We amazing. almost never refund money. Because yeah. we, we jump through as many hoops as we have to to make sure that our customers love their new clothes. Because, yeah. hey, like I said, we want them to, to wear it for years. But more importantly, when they need another one of those things, you know, they're, they're going to think about Citizen Wolf. 
Yeah, love it. Well, let's talk about the customer. Um, I believe you sold 70,000 garments to date yeah, around that number. Just over that. Mm -hmm. Just over that. So we know that global data, you know, and typical consumerism, or global data is telling us that typical consumerism is certainly shifting, right? There is this conscious consumption that's becoming more prevalent, still a lot of work to do. But yeah. let's talk about the customers that you're attracting to your brand. What do you know about them? So for the most part, our customers tend to be a little bit older than than the average, I guess, or than, than what traditional fashion sort of targets. Yeah. We're not chasing the 18-year-old kids, basically. Um, the people that end up finding us uh, and loving us and buying more and more of our stuff tend to be a bit older. So they're probably like 35 plus, yeah. a little more comfortable in their skin. They're not looking for their identity be, to be validated by logos and, and that kind of stuff. They're sort of beyond that stage in their life. On the dollars, it's roughly even men and women because because we sell both. Um, yeah. We have more female customers though. Like So just on the absolute value, we have more women in the system, but men tend to buy more um, just because of sort of laziness effectively <laughs> and like, I got one that fits great. Just give me one in every color and I won't see you for two years. And that suits us just fine. Do you yeah. know much about their lifestyle? Is it tending to be the customer that is truly focused on, you know, more conscious consumption or is it that they love the experience of the custom fit? They love the quality. Like have you done any surveys around, you know, what what's driving their purchasing behavior? Yeah, there's a, there's a, is it all of those things, yeah. uh, uh, you know, can be found certainly when we talk to our customers, older women in particular, um, we get, you know, certain feedback all the time that sort of, you know, fashion finishes at 40 or maybe 50, you know, we've had women who are over 90 years old shop with us. Um, yeah. and they love it because, you know, you get to a certain point where you know what you want Yeah, and you're very particular probably in what you want. And this is not a gender-based behavior. This is everybody. You just, you're just like, I just can't be bothered to go to the mall or whatever and like try on 30 different black jackets or whatever it is that you might be, you might be looking for. You know the fabric you want, you know the color that you want, you know the style that suits your body, all of these things. And so once you know, once you understand yourself like this, then 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 we exist to service those people who who know exactly what they want. And mm. I mean it's it's interesting that because that's like in the name, you know, we when we were trying to find the name of, of Citizen Wolf, we knew that we weren't going to be selling clothes to people that were waiting to be told what was cool by the fashion industry. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe unkindly, we were referring to those people as sheep, right? The people that are just waiting for the top down old school fashion, like, or well, now it's the influencers, whatever, saying you should buy this and this is going to make you happy and this is going to make you cool and all this shit. They were not our people and we knew that from the start. And so if we weren't selling to the sheep, then we were selling to the wolves, right? And so that's where the wolf part of the name came from. And then we knew that at the same time, slight negative connotations around wolf in terms of loner, which is not true, but anyway, this kind of thing. And so yeah. we knew we had to balance it with something and, and then we knew the way we were working was going to be more beneficial to the environment. And so then it was well, citizen citizens of the world, basically, people who care about things bigger than themselves, specifically the planet. And so that's how we ended up at Citizen Wolf. Mm, I love it. I love that backstory. Um, I'm feeling a bit, a bit of a quiet luxury vibe, but at really affordable prices. It's like that minimalistic way of dressing, yep. you know, high quality, but accessible prices and custom fit to your body. Yep. So I'll tell them, what can't you do? You're doing polos, you're doing tees, <laughs> you're doing shirts, right? So yeah. where are the pain points in your business? So if I'm your customer and I, I do want that complete look or that complete wardrobe, yeah. what can't you make for me at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question. So we started off with T-shirts, then we went to polo sweats and most recently button-down shirts. And you'll notice they're all top of body. Yeah. Um, so our, our algorithm is very well calibrated for the upper body. It's less well calibrated for the bottom, although Magic Fit does spit out the entire estimate of, of everything, like legs and thighs and bums and the whole bit. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly variance above the waist. Um, 
there's a lot more variance below the waist, let's say. And so technically it is more of a challenge uh, for us to do pants. But that is that is on the roadmap. Like we want to be able to make it, to your point, anything anything that you might need. So we want to be able to make jackets. We want to be able to make pants. We want to be able to make jeans. You know, I mm-hmm. fundamentally, our North Star in many ways is jeans. If we can de- deliver custom fit denim at a reasonable price, I think that I, you know, I might be able to buy a house in Sydney one day <laughs> <laughs> if I can do that. Yeah. Um, and so like that, that is our North Star. But I guess the kind of through line in terms of product is that we do only make the classic wardrobe staples, you know, like we're not competing in fashion design competitions. We don't go to fashion week, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, it is fashion week this week, so it's on the mind. Mm-hmm. We make the the classics, the timeless, seasonless or trans seasonal basics effectively that that everybody wears. And so Whatever yeah. that might be, that that's certainly on our roadmap. Where it, where it gets really hard for us is that because, as I said, we had to start our own factory to work this way. Every time we put on a new category, we actually have to skill up the factory to be able to make that thing. So yeah. other brands would just be like, I need to make a jacket. Cool. That's like you go to Google and you're like jacket factory in Portugal or wherever, right? Yeah. And you find something. Um, we can't do that. So we've, our, our, Expansion of the product line has been has been quite slow over the last eight years, um, and it will remain quite slow. But as I said, we're we're gunning for all those other categories. It's just that we've got to we've got to sort of it's not as easy, I guess, quote unquote, as it is for other brands to to put on a new style. No, absolutely not. It's definitely a long game. But you would definitely be buying that house if you can crack the code for blazers. And yeah. yes, the bottom of the body, jeans in particular, hardest things to buy, in particular to buy online. So, you know, if you can get yeah. a custom fit there, yes, um, that'll be a game changer. Now, you touched so. on waste earlier. I don't want to skim over that because I know how much effort you've put into, you know, your circular model and that you're really passionate about not only keeping product in circulation longer, yeah. but that zero waste Um, kind of focus so can we just talk about the end-to-end process there again you know a little bit of a dose of reality for those listening in terms of the challenges you face but some you've been able to resolve and others might be a future vision yeah so from day one we decided that we were going to put no waste into the world no landfill I should sorry I should qualify obviously we make stuff right and obviously that generates a waste stream and it obviously generates carbon as well we're not in the software business right but we made a very clear decision on day one to do actually a few things but one of them was 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 zero waste so you know when we began eric and i we had a little shop in darlinghurst um it was like it was a garage actually and we hand measured about two thousand people and then we hand cut 2000 t-shirts like modifying paper patterns right to to tailor the t-shirts to to these individual customers now i'd never picked up a pair of scissors in my life i'd never i've never cut fabric but we were like shit how hard can it be the pattern maker wasn't very <laughs> happy when i when i said look i just want to sit with you for a week and learn enough to be dangerous about cutting fabric so and again look it's jersey it's it's easier than other things to work with for sure so that was how we started um and from that very first T-shirt that we cut, we we just put all the waste in a bag, put all the waste in a bag, put all the waste in a bag, put all the waste in a bag. And most people would just like almost factories. When the bag got full, they just take it to the tip because that, that's what you do. It's basically worthless. We've gone through various iterations over the years um, in terms of what to do with that waste stream. The the latest and and the, the most important, I suppose, is is what I was talking about before where we combine it with any any um, end of life garments that we receive from our customers, and um, unfortunately, we have to send it offshore, which is really disappointing. There's no one here in Australia that can that can do it, that can process or recycle the fiber. Unfortunately, I should also say one of the other decisions we made on day one was to only use natural fibers. So. Because of that, that's basically why we can now be 100% circular because we're not waiting for the science in terms of, to catch up in terms of like disassembling polycotton blends and things like that. So we've only put on natural fiber. We do organic cotton, hemp, merino, linen, things like that, uh, tensile. All of that can be mechanically recycled. 
unfortunately it doesn't happen on shore. So we send it offshore, it gets turned into yarn, which we re- we then re-import and we knit into fabric in Melbourne. So almost all of our jersey is knitted in Melbourne. Um, we're very passionate, obviously, about making things in Australia, but also pushing that ethos down the supply chain as far as we can. You know, there's only two knitting mills that are left in Melbourne now, and, and we work with one of them. Yeah. Uh, and very, very happily and very proudly for many years now, we've we've been doing that. So we re-import the yarn, we knit it into New Jersey, and then from there we we make new new T-shirts. Okay, that's quite the circular process. With the offshore partner, where, where are they located? And do you see an onshore solution coming down the pipeline? I'd love to hope that we can make this, do this onshore in the future. Yeah. I've been having a few conversations recently about that. And depending on who you speak to, you get wildly different answers. But um, there's a really talented, amazing woman called Muriel Chamberlain. Oh, yes. You probably know Muriel. Met um, her, yes. Yeah, so she she just got the grant from Country Road out of their climate fund and she's, she's very, very seriously doing some um, analysis on, on, on the kind of machine that we could import to do this locally. And the great news is it's not tens of millions of dollars. I was told it was hundreds of millions of dollars. It, it's actually not to... To do this, it's it's like low digit single millions, which don't get me wrong, is a lot of money. Mm. Um, but for the, for what we're doing or the sort of scale of things that we need in Australia, then it it would be actually appropriate. Yeah. So I, I'm hopeful that 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 goes ahead. That would be awesome. Mm. At the moment, we work out of Spain, um, so there's a there's a mob there called Recover. Yeah. And they've been um, they've been mechanically recycling yarn for I don't know I think seventy years or something like that a long long time. Yeah. When we started working with them, their minimums were high but not crazy. They've recently put the minimum up to eight thousand kilos. Uh-huh. And then it's so uh, our recycled fabric is fifty percent recycled and then 50, spun around a core of fifty percent organic cotton that that's virgin yeah. for strength. So if I send them 8,000 kilos, I get back not quite 16,000, but not far off. And that's a lot of yarn for us. So that's really unfortunate because it's basic. They're basically like we can't use them anymore. So now we're partnering with Courtney Home, who you probably know yes, from ABCH. I yeah. do. We've been working with Courtney for a long time in finding a new supplier f- for this, which is now going to be coming out of Turkey. And they can do a minimum batch of 500 kilos, which is obviously much more palatable for us. We've got, just for your reference, we've got about 2,000 kilos of waste just like squirreled around the factory in various boxes and things. Yeah. Because, you know, as I said, we don't want to, we said we would never put anything into landfill. And so we keep just like stuffing it into boxes here and there. um, But we are, you know, we need to solve this. And yeah, that's how we do it. Well, you're not taking on the easy tasks. I'll give you that. It's not for the faint-hearted, right? You've you've no. gone into the micro uh, improvements in every single area of your business, and what you've just shared there, you know, this is not a set and forget, you know, process. So you found a solution for waste that became not an option anymore. You've had to find another solution. You're collaborating with people in the industry like Courtney and Meryl. So you're very much, you know, breaking down some of the boundaries. I think that uh, perhaps some businesses just will put that into the too hard basket. So I think there's a lot for, you know, those who are tuning in to learn, um, not in regards to just finding solutions, but I think the tenacity and resilience it takes to be a thought leader in this space and truly minimise impact and make change. But we know that all of that comes at a cost. I'd love for you to share just because, you know, as you're talking about everything that you're doing in the business, you're thinking, oh, my God, how much are these garments going to cost? Let's share the retail prices of some of the product in your range because I just think they're phenomenal based on everything that goes into the process. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, look, we're not cheap, unfortunately. We don't compete on at the mass market. Well, not yet. Anyway, there's an asterisk there and I can I can go into to that. But, you know, at the moment our T-shirts start at $89. And just to, you know, that's not expensive. You go into any, any bloody like surf skate shop, you might, and admittedly they're graphic tees or whatever, but, you know, 
made by the bazillion by VF Corp. And you're not paying very much less than that. Of course, there's a whole bunch of like business models stuff that led to that price, but just in terms of kind of anchoring or parity. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for your 89 bucks, it goes up from there you, because depending the your choice of fabric determines the ultimate price. So merino wool is much more expensive. We have several different weights of organic cotton and we have a hemp blend as well. Yeah. So they're, they're all different prices. But, yeah, that starts at 89 bucks, and that gets you 100% natural, 100% circular, made in Australia and custom made to fit your body. That, okay, so when, when you said we're not cheap... I might, I might have to dispute that. I think that that's a pretty good price point for all of the tick, tick, ticks that you've just mentioned. So that's your tees. What about you. your shirts, for example? Yeah, our button-down shirts start at two nine nine. Yeah. Um. So that's using a, a fabric out of Spain again, actually, because there are no woven mills left in Australia for shirting. Yeah. Anyway, um. Apart from that, I think there's one big defence contractor, but you know they. They work for defence. So we do have to import the wovens um, as a person, as I was saying about the jersey, knitting it in Melbourne. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's an organic cotton poplin or Oxford. Um, our yeah. Oxfords are a little bit more because there's just more labour involved in the placket and the extra buttons and being a pocket and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so the our Oxford shirts are 329. Yeah. And, and your sweats? Let's talk about your sweats for a minute. Sweats are 199. Um, so that's, yeah, again, that's knitted in Melbourne, organic, pure organic cotton, uh, French terry. And yeah. about, I think it's 290 GSM. No, yeah. yes, 290 GSM. Yeah. And I think, you know, what you're mentioning again, you know, it's the natural fibers, there's the organics in there. You can select your base material depending on the price point that you want to achieve. So there's a lot of variety, but again, we're talking about custom and we're talking about circularity. We're talking about minimizing waste. There's a lot of added value there. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Cause I would assume, you know, people were thinking that price points would be way beyond that. So I think you've really nailed it based on everything that you're building into the product and the brand. Now, eight years in, yep. you don't do this on your own. Um, no. We know your HQ's in Sydney. Let's talk about who's on the team. Mm. I should say, importantly, if anyone's interested, if you are in Sydney, we our factory is open to the public. We're in Marrickville. Uh, we are very proudly transparent, unlike other garment manufacturers you might sort of know or, or have, you know, maybe have your mental model. Um, certainly post sort of Bangladesh run a plaza where everyone thinks that all garment factories basically lock their staff in and make them work 24 hours a day. We don't do that. No. And to prove it, you can come in any day of the week and see us in action. Um, we're not open Sunday, but six days a week. We have 13 people on staff. Most of those people are in the factory. So nine of our 13 people make the clots. Uh, that means there's actually there's four and a half people um, who do all of the rest of it, you know. Yeah. And I guess the thing about Citizen Wolf is, yes, we operate like a traditional brand. So all of the things that a normal brand would do, we do, sure. As I said, we have the factory and that is where our headcount sits, but we also have created all our own technology in-house. Mm. So basically we're a tech company too. And so between the tech and the brand and the customer service, uh, that's four and a half people. So, yeah, we're an incredibly lean team. We wear a lot of hats. Um, there's never enough hours in the day, frankly. Mm. Um, but, you know, we are getting better at uh, at prioritising. Let's mm. just say that. It is, it is a lean team. So your team members who are making the clothes, what's your point of view around, you know, the skill shortage in Australia and yeah. have you got a plan in place to to mitigate that for your own business? Yeah, look, it's a it's an excellent question and it's something that we obviously think about a lot. For context, um, all of our seamstresses are about, the minimum age is probably about 60. Mm. They're all Chinese or Vietnamese, uh, Burmese um, ladies, and they are incredibly skilled mm. and we are incredibly uh, lucky to have them. And actually that's the one part of our business where we have zero churn. Mm -hmm. So our very first seamstress came from the social outfit. If you know those guys, um, 
we actually sublet the second story of our factory to the social outfit now, which we're really happy about. Because to your other point, it's basically giving it, it gives us a pipeline into into new new potential seamstresses. So for those of you who don't know the social outfit, they're an incredible charity, uh, which basically takes recently arrived refugees into in Australia, um, either improves or teaches them how to sew and puts them through a, a multi-year training period at the back end of which they can go out into the into the industry and find jobs. So yeah. our very first seamstress came from the social outfit and uh, we're very proud to to still have her. Um all of our st- all of our full time staff. I should also say, all of our full time staff are shareholders in the business. Wow. It was really, really important to Eric and I that we were and still are asking people to, in many ways, you know, take a gamble on us and our mission and what we're doing, knowing that it's different to the rest of the industry, um, knowing that innovation is is often very difficult as well. Yeah. So it was very important to us that you know, any upside is shared am- amongst all the staff members. So everyone who's full-time has shares, which is really important, including our seamstresses, which is probably not how most brands operate. I love that. I love that. It's such a, I mean, it's just you're investing in each other, right? So, yeah. and if the business we wins. We couldn't exist without them, exactly. No, business wins, everyone wins. So I love that. I love that relationship with the social outfit, yeah? So you've got your ecosystem in place, we're yeah. working with an industry partner and, um, you know, there's that social element as well, the training, the support, everything that, you know, workers who are, who are learning a new skill require. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about the marketing side. Mm-hmm. So again, eight years in, how have you taken your brand to market and what challenges have you faced and what's next? Yeah. So we're a direct consumer brand. Because we do custom fit tailoring, we basically cannot be wholesale. From day one, we, we've had to be direct to consumer, and that means e comp, and that means performance marketing. So, we, the irony, I think, from in terms of my background in Eric's too, is that although we come from an advertising background, we didn't run any ads for probably the first four years of the business, I think. We were so busy and we had our hands full trying to figure out the what we were doing, the tech, the factory, the whole bit, that we were just sort of like, oh, shit, we could have, we'll worry about the ads later kind of thing. Um, and as I said at the start, we had a little a little garage on in Darlinghurst and that was basically, that was our acquisition channel. So we were 100% offline for the first couple of years. And then once we built the algorithm, that was basically the gate, I guess, that, that allowed us to, to go into e-com. Yeah. And now we're, I think we're 80%, roughly 80% e-com, about 10% through the shop that's attached to the factory in Marrickville, and then 10% in terms of uniforms. So we have a yep. uniforms business as well. Performance marketing is a necessary evil, I guess. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's also something that we we decided early on that we needed to insource because being able to acquire customers is a core discipline of a DTC company. And we began our, our performance marketing journey outsourcing that to an agency. Um, it started really well. Then it went a less, little bit less better the next month, a bit less better, a bit less better. And then at the end, it, it, it wasn't that great. And we were like, what the hell's going on? And they were like, oh, I don't know we've got other fashion brands and we do the exact same thing and they're like flying like a rocket. And it's like, yeah, well, it's some 18 year old bird on the Gold Coast with the boobs out selling bikinis. Like that's not what we do. Of course, your playbook for her is not going to work for us. You idiots. Like what are you doing to understand what we do and understand our customers and what they might want? Anyway, they they couldn't do it and they couldn't figure it out. And so we split, um, and at that point, we decided we had to, had to insource that that discipline. So, we the three co-founders we went on a, in a you know years long journey basically to start to understand how that works. Yeah, I don't think we're particularly excellent digital marketers. I think we're competent, um, and we're certainly getting better. So, 
Two years ago, we raised a million dollars on virtual. And one of the first things we did with that money is employ a full-time video guy, mm, content, content creator. Content. Yeah. And that that's the thing that's really changed the equation for us in terms of our performance results. So our ROAS is up 50% in the last two years since we put him on. Yeah. Um, and that's just a velocity thing, you know, like, yes, the stuff that we're making looks better than it ever did, but we're just, we're able to execute at speed that we that we couldn't do before and so you know if anyone asks me anything about performance that's my first suggestion is Mm. like you just got to be making lots of it yeah I think you've made such important points there you've got to find the model that works for your business so as you rightly said for your business outsourcing to an agency didn't quite work they didn't really understand the dynamics of your model or perhaps it was just in the too hard basket because it's not, yeah. you know, the, the the set and forget kind of model that they'd be doing for, for other brands that they'd be innately, you know, used to. Um, and when it becomes a little bit more complex, you know, it's more labour intensive and time is money for obviously an yeah. agency. I've had so many different um, guests actually on this po- podcast talking about performance marketing and I had mentioned to you about Jay Wright and Jay Wright yes. is an e-commerce expert he has business called e-commerce equation and his whole thing is sack your agency now mind you he used to own an agency so he innately knows how the agency works but he does take you through i've been on lots of his uh, master classes or webinars and he talks about you know you you basically taking the power back you know yeah. internally in your business learn the skill and innately be able to you know pivot fine tune that it's those little incremental improvements can can make a big impact in the business when you're talking about performance marketing. So you've got to be on it 24 seven, but and for that's other the clients, difficulty, right? yeah, totally. But for other clients that I work with, they've got amazing agencies and they would never yeah. want to bring that in house. So for our audience, you just got to find what works for you. But I like what you've said, you've brought it in. Um, I'm sure there's been a lot to learn over the journey and you're seeing the improvements. And we'd also touched on brand marketing, you know, how important, brand marketing is for a business like yours because it is such an experiential product and brand. So I love that you've brought on the content creator. We know we've got to feed the content generating machine out there (laughs) Um, and we've got to be front and center and it's got to be entertaining and it's got to be dynamic content as well. So no doubt, um, yeah, a lot of insights there for our audience. Now you touched on the crowdfunding. And we want to shine a huge light on this today. So you've mm-hmm. launched your second round through virtual. Yep. So let's just share with everyone. I know you're off to an exciting start with this. So let's just share with everyone what you're setting out to achieve. And if they were interested in getting involved, why should they? Thanks. So yes, we, we're we live on virtual at the moment. Uh, it only went live maybe 48 hours ago. So we passed the minimum threshold in the first 24 hours, which was really cool. Nice. Um, we've got we've done about a quarter so far of the maximum amount that we uh, of shares that we have available in this round. So we're about a quarter of the way through to the max, which is great because um, we have only just got started. Two years ago, I said we raised a million dollars and we said we'd do three things with the money. We said we'd scale the product because at that point we were T-shirts only and we've done that. We said we'd scale the factory to keep up um, with the, that new those new product lines, and we've done that. And we said we'd take the brand international, and we haven't done that yet. That's still a work in progress, but we've, you know, we went through a very long process to rebuild the website from scratch. That launched just earlier this year in Feb, uh, and so we're we're now we're we're testing uh, international sales this time around on virtual. We we're saying something different. And that is that we've identified an incredibly large opportunity in uh, the uniform space. So we've always made uniforms um, ever since day one. Basically, what would happen is somebody came into the consumer business, loved what we made for them, and either ran their own business or worked within a, a team within a large corporate and basically said, I want more people to have this experience. And so then very kindly basically said, you know, can you make 20 or 50 or whatever branded t-shirts effectively and we had you know local cafes and bars and and that kind of stuff as well mostly small scale contracts but we've been doing it you know pretty much since the start and it's all been inbound we've you know as i said we've had our hands full trying to build this direct consumer brand and the tech and the factory and like we've had our hands full so we haven't been chasing uniforms 
But then what happened about a, a year ago is that we got a call out of the blue from somebody in the federal government and they said, look, the Great Barrier Reef Authority um, has, has recently gone out to tender for their uniforms and nobody was able to meet the sustainability criteria because the last round of uniforms they had, guess what they were made out of? Polyester. Polyester. <laughs> and this time around, somebody with more brains than last time was like, you guys cannot be putting polyester, you cannot be putting microplastics into the water, like you're the bloody Great Barrier Reef Authority. No. And so the tender that went out, nobody, nobody could, could meet the criteria. And so they called us and said, look, we, we're putting it, we're opening it up again. And, and if you're interested, you know, you might want to think about applying. So we did, we jumped through all the many, many, many myriad hoops um, of becoming an accredited government supplier and, and we won that tender. And yeah, we've done about $100,000 worth of uniforms for them in, in the last 12 months. They're just in the middle of renewing the contract, which is really great. And it was sort of a bit of a light bulb for us where, moment, sorry, a light bulb moment for us where we basically were like, whoa, hang on, there's this entire market over here that's the really unsexy side of the fashion industry, right? Nobody wakes up one day and goes, I want to get into the uniforms business. It's, it's a uniform a business. <laughs> Apart from the people that are in it, and they, yeah. they obviously, you know, they they know why they're in it because it's yeah. a lot easier in many ways than than consumer fashion. So, And then the more we looked into it, the more we started to understand that, you know, it's a relatively large market in Australia. It's $1.2 billion. But more importantly, we're at this moment in time where all big corporates and governments alike have ESG targets, which are only getting stricter every year. And that obviously touches procurement. And so... For the first time, everybody is starting to look at what they buy and how they can make that more sustainable. And that was the sustainability threads is basically what got us across the line with the Great Barrier Reef, along with an infinite size range. And because of our Magic Fit technology, what we're able to do is basically, if I summarize the tech, what it does is it reduces the marginal cost of tailoring to zero effectively. Because we our factory is single piece, whether it whether it makes a, a, a standard medium or Bob's T-shirt, it doesn't matter, right? The yeah. factory doesn't care. So infinite size range plus sustainability, like true circularity in the whole bit is what got us across the line with the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and so, yeah, then we were like, shit, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. And all of, the, all of the technology that we've built, the supply chain that we've built, the factory that we've built, everything that we've built for consumer can actually just be transferred in its entirety to an entirely new market. Yeah. And so that's why we're going out to virtual now uh, with a story around uniforms. Mm -hmm. And what, what we want to do is separate the production lines in the factory because at the moment they compete. Like when we get a big corporate order or, or uniforms order, it competes with the with the direct consumer orders. And, and so that's not ideal. So we want to separate it out. We do want to start chasing more contracts like the Barrier Reef. Uh, ourselves so like that means biz dev and yeah. then um and then we also want to start licensing our technology to the big uniform players because as i said what we've built for the consumer side is great but yeah. actually it solves very real very expensive problems uh within the uniforms market which if we've got time i'm happy to dive into but it's it's yeah a, it's it's, it's, ex it's exciting. I think it's exciting. What are you setting out to raise and what's the window? When does it close? So we're looking to raise $600,000 and it closes on the 30th of May. 600K, 30th of May. And how far did you get into that in the last 24 hours? Uh, we've got just over 150 grand so far. So yeah, oh. about 25%. Off to a great, off to a great start. So if someone's yeah. sitting there on the fence at the moment and thinking, oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, you know, I, I could get involved. Why should I get involved? What's your pitch? Um, well, firstly, if you've got any questions, reach out to me. I'm, I'm, I'm on the phone. I'm on email. I'm more than happy to, to chat and, and answer any questions you might have. In terms of why, I think it comes down to whether or not you believe in our mission, whether or not you believe like we do that the, that the business model behind fashion is broken and that the, that the industry is at odds with solving climate change. And whether or not you agree with our thesis that making mass production obsolete is the best way to solve that problem. Because all of the waste issues that I identified at the very start in terms of consumer fashion 
are the exact same issues they have in the uniforms market. So yeah. it doesn't matter if we're making clothes for you or your, you know, anybody you know, or we're making clothes for one of the government departments, we're solving the same issue, which is uh, overproduction is the dirty secret at the heart of the fashion industry and it's what's killing the planet. So we're, we're, we're setting out to prove that you don't have to work that way. And, um, and yeah, if you believe in, in that thesis, then please join us. We'd love to have you. Uh, we've got over almost 600 uh, investors so far. So between the last virtual and, and so far in, in this one, it's probably well over 600 by now. you will be joining a large cohort of, of people that, that think just like you and, and helping us achieve our mission. Absolutely love it. And such a powerful way for you to scale as a business, you know, and another sector of the market, you're going to be able to amplify the amazing work that you're doing and have a positive impact on such a, a larger scale. Yeah. In, in, in a sector that is much needing a model like yours. Yes. So the reason we identified uniforms is because quite simply, Elizabeth, we're living in the future. And it's it's lonely and it's tiring. And I say that to say that we fundamentally believe that the consumer fashion market will come to the point, will meet us where we are in terms of on-demand production. Maybe not for every single thing that gets made, but certainly for a small to medium, even large share of the overall production pie. I think it has to move that way, but it's going to take time. And the problem with the consumer business is that it's always on. The treadmill just never stops season after season after season. We've been approached. We, we did a pilot with KidX about a year ago where we put our Magic Fit technology onto her website and her customers got uh, tailoring for the very first time. And it was great. And it worked. Everybody, everybody was happy. The problem is that the consumer business, no one's got the bandwidth to think about re-engineering the model right? Because everyone's just like flat out trying to keep up with the next drop and the next drop and the next drop. Where that differs in the uniforms market is that because these are like multi-year contracts for the most part, they are finite. And at the end of the contract, there's this beautiful moment in time where it is actually possible to re-engineer the way things are done and to go in there with an idea about a new model that's better. And in that fallow period between the old contract ending and the new contract starting, it's entirely possible to change the way that things have been done. And so that's why we're really excited about the uniform space and in specifically like licensing our technology into existing large uniform suppliers. Um, because yeah, it's, it's just, it's a different way of, at the end of the day, we're making clothes, whether it's uniforms or consumer, right. But the way that the, the industry operates um, it is fundamentally different. And so that's the opportunity that we've identified mm -hmm. in the short term. Well, that's where the powerful impact comes in. It is ch change is the hardest thing and you've got an opportunity to go in there and be part of that. And we're talking about, you know, change at scale, which is, you know, again, that's that's where you want to be playing when you're talking about impact. Definitely. Zoltan, we're at the pointy end now. I've got one final question for you. And that yep. is, in closing, what excites you most, either about the future of the fashion industry or the manufacturing industry? And so I think on the manufacturing side, what we, we've spoken a lot about it internally, you know, I think robotic sewing machines are going to, there's a, there's a negative downside to them in terms of they're going to put a lot of people out of a job that people that really, really need those jobs, um, less so in Australia because we don't make a lot of things here anymore. And that's not great. Let me start there. But the opportunity for, for an advanced industrial or advanced country like Australia is that we can, through robotic sewing machines, we can start to reshore a hell of a lot more of the production in the or garment apparel manufacturing than, than we can currently do. So at the moment, we do only about 5% of the clothes that are sold in Australia are actually made here. It's around that point. Very, very, very small amounts, right? I really do believe that the future of Australian manufacturing in our sector is is um, automated through robotics and the the really exciting thing there is that the robot doesn't care if it's in bankstown or bangladesh as long as it's powered by solar the unit economics should be roughly similar and what that means is that 
we can start, we can deliver the exact same product we do today via Citizen Wolf with all of the same benefits for a fraction of the cost. And I think at that point in time, we start to achieve, be able to achieve change, impact at scale through the consumer business, which, which is awesome, right? And that technology is coming down the pipe. It's not even that far away. There, there's plenty of people doing prototypes. Nobody's cracked it as far as I understand. But like within five years, it's going to be fairly commonplace at scale in terms of garment manufacturing. And I think there's an incredible opportunity for Australia um, to, to be part of that. On the uniform side, you know, I, our, our tech solves very real, very costly problems for the biggest suppliers. There's only four, there's four players in the Australian uniforms industry that control 50% of the market. So about $600 million a year annually between them. And we know that we can walk in there tomorrow and basically save them money. And so that is incredibly exciting for us in the short term in terms of changing the way that they do business and ultimately changing the waste that, that those kind of businesses create and basically taking it to zero. So yeah, there's a, there's a heap I'm, I'm excited about. Um, none of it's easy, like you said, but hey, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it, right? Exactly. But we've got to say you are on the forefront of change. You're not just talking about it, you're doing it. So congratulations to you, to Eric, to your entire team that has been part of the last eight years of Citizen Wolf. They say in fashion, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. So you're pretty close. (laughs) Only two years left. You're you're almost there. Phew. (laughs) <laughs> so you can you can sit you can kick back in a couple of years. Good yeah. luck with the crowd funding. We will share all of the links to virtual in our show notes, and we'll amplify this kind, across thanks. all of our channels. Uh, definitely want to offer our support. We admire all of the work that you do. We've been following your journey for some time, so thank you for being generous with your time and sharing the insights of your business today. Good luck. I hope you achieve that 600K and do all the wonderful things that you've shared with us um, and take this brand and this business and this technology to the next level and unfuck the fashion industry. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Fashion Business Mindset Podcast. We'd love to keep connected. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Fashion Equipped. Head to our website, fashionequipped.com.au. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with others. Hit subscribe, leave us a rating and review. Let's do this together. Let's make the fashion business your business. This is a Guide Your Light Network production, creating podcasts with purpose.